Hello and welcome to Mr. C History. Now today I'm on a journey to find out more about South Asian history and the history of the South Asian community here in Britain and also what we can find out about countries like India, Bangladesh, Pakistan here in Britain. Now, I've started here on Middlesex Street just off the edge of the city of London otherwise known as Petticoat Lane. Now there's been a mention of Petticoat Lane since 1608 and interestingly this Pet Street has been a haven for immigrants to Britain to this country. It started off with the French Huguenots fleeing the French Revolution it then was a home to the Jewish population fleeing Russia of uh, the pogroms and in the 1970s it became a safe haven for the Bangladeshi community here in Britain. Why such a haven for immigrants and specifically Bangladeshis? Well, Petticoat Lane is associated with the textiles industry or the garment creation industry. And that is for several reasons. One is the cheap housing that is available to people, but also its proximity to the city of London, those who have money and those who need nice new clothes, suits, etc. Now the Bangladeshi communities first came here in the 1970s and many of them actually came from the city of Silet in Bangladesh. Now Silet is synonymous with cotton, clothes, garments, etc. So they took many of the skills they had there, many of the jobs they had there, and they, when they arrived in Britain, they simply took many of the similar jobs they had before. Why the 1970s though? Well, Bangladesh became independent from Pakistan. It had previously been called East Pakistan in 1971. It had broken away from India during partition in the late 1940s, Pakistan, what we call Pakistan now, and Bangladesh were actually one country. They broke away in 1971 after a brutal civil war. So Bangladesh was extremely poor. It suffered horrendous famines and floods after all the civil strife. Many people also had connections here in Britain. So there was a large, large diaspora here in Britain and the Bangladeshi community grew and grew. But sadly, by the late 1970s, tensions between the local community and the Bangladeshi community were beginning to worsen. Initially, many of the Bangladeshi community had been encouraged to come to Britain by the British government to build up Britain's economy after the Second World War. But by the end of the 1970s, the economy was taking a nosedive. Inflation was rampant, unemployment was extremely high, the three-day week, coal strikes, the winter of discontent, we all know about that. This coincides inevitably with the rise of the far right, the National Front, who specifically target the Bangladeshi community or the South Asian community in Britain. And sadly, it all comes to a head here in Altab Ali Park, or as then it was known as St Mary's Park, on May the 4th, 1978, when a young 25-year-old young Altab Ali, a textiles worker, probably over in Brick Lane or Petticoat Lane, was walking through here, he was attacked by three teenagers and he was brutally stabbed to death. It caused outrage, indeed it caused something called the, what's known as the Battle of Brick Lane, but in reality it was a protest, a protest march from Brick Lane over there to Downing Street demanding change, demanding a justice, demanding a total societal change towards the Bangladeshi community. It stands out today and they renamed this park Altab Ali Park and it stands as a good example of the resilience of the Bangladeshi community to just carry on, keep fighting and they're still here today very much so. I am in Annerley near Crystal Palace in South London and behind me is a house with the blue plaque to Dadabai Naroji. Now he was a tremendous overachiever and indeed his nickname is the Grand Old Man of India. And as it says there, he was Indian nationalist and MP, so an extraordinarily significant figure. Now he had an extraordinarily long life from 1825 all the way up to 1917. Uh, and he was born in uh, Bombay, or as it's now known, Mumbai, to relatively well-off middle-class family, educated well, moved to Britain in 1855, made a bit of a fortune in the cotton mills. So quite a normal-ish life, but he really starts to make a turn. But in 1885, he decides to enter politics. And the first thing he does, he sets up a political party called the INC, the Indian National Congress, or the Congress Party, one of the most significant political parties in Indian political history, well, ever. They were the party of Gandhi and Nehru. They were the party post uh, partition and post independence from 1947. They were indeed led much of the independence campaign, and they're still a political force today. 
and it was Naroji here who he was the co-founder of that political party way back in 1885. But he doesn't stop there. In the 1892 British election, he campaigns in the London constituency of Finsbury and he wins. He gets elected to the British Parliament. He is the first person from India to become an MP. Indeed, he is the first person of colour to become a British MP. An incredible achievement. He's only MP for three years, but he makes a really important, significant speech in Parliament. And it's known as the Drain Theory speech, where he stands up in Parliament and he essentially says, the British Empire is draining India dry of all its resources, its costs and its people, its, its natural products, etc. And, and India needs its own determination. And so he campaigns for more representations for Indian people, self-determination, like I said, India should govern itself. This is amazing. 1892, very, very early, before the 1920s, 30s, Gandhi um, pushes that movement forward. It, the idea of India as a country that should and can govern itself started with Naroji. This is the corner of George Street and Manchester Street in Marylebone District of London. And specifically behind me is number 34 George Street, which in 1810 housed the first ever curry house in Britain. It was called the Hindustani Coffee House and it was set up by a man called Saki Dean Muhammad. And it, his aim was to sort of just actually provide proper authentic curries to officers who had served in India who developed the taste for it. So this is believed to be the place where they served the first authentic-ish curry in Britain. But this is a good place to talk about the significance and importance of South Asian food on Britain. I mean, it's ubiquitous and huge now, massive, massive global industry that has pushed forward. And as I say, it's had a long history, right into World War II, and I was just reading about this, this is extraordinary. Many British soldiers in their ration pack had little jars of curry powder, Madras curry powder. Okay, not very authentic, but they took them to Germany and Japan with them as they were liberating, left them there, and they, that morphed into things like curry burst and katsu curry. So even the legacy of South Asian food goes on to many of those other countries as well. This, of course, is the very famous Lloyd's building in the heart of the city of London. Now, this building was built in the 1980s, but from the year 1600, right up to 1874 on the exact same location as this building was the headquarters of the East India Company, one of the most significant corporations or entities or rulers in a way to, of impact on India, mainly negative certainly for the local population. Now what's the history? They were set up by Queen Elizabeth I in 1600 mainly to deal with the trade with spices, cotton, silk, things like that and they set up posts along the coasts, what is modern day Mumbai, Chennai, Calcutta, etc. But their power and influence grew, they made deals with the local population and crucially their military prowess also developed and this culminated in 1757, the Battle of Plassey, where East India forces led by Robert Clive, Clive of India, defeated the Nawab of Bengal and essentially took control of the Bengal region, the most powerful and resource rich part of India they essentially control India. And this word control is interesting. India, for a good 100, 150 years, maybe even longer, was controlled by a company, not, not actually by a government, by a company based here at Leadenhall Street in the city of London. How were they able to do this? Well, military might, we've just said, spoken about that, economic might, of course, but also many MPs in the British Parliament and indeed perhaps the monarchy were in the pocket of the East India Company. They were benefiting an awful lot from that. How do they rule? Well, brutally. They were, the military power, as I said, was horrible and they were exploitative. They exploited the local India population and India itself. And this culminated in 1857, the India Mutiny, where the people of India said, we've had enough of the East India Company. They pushed them aside, but actually the East India Company is just replaced by direct control from the British government, the start of the British Raj. And they carry on for another 90 years. So the, the Indians didn't really fight off the East India Company. And by 1874, it's dissolved and no longer exists. And the building we have here today. But their legacy is huge. An exploitation of India, exploitation of the resources and the development of the British Raj. Finally, by 1947, India was able to shake off the yoke of colonialism. This is India Place, just off the Strand. And behind me, of course, is a bust to Jawaharlal Nehru, 
the first Prime Minister of independent India and a key, key figure in the independence movement. Now, I've made a video before about Mahatma Gandhi, and Gandhi was extraordinarily significant in the independence movement, of course, but Nehru played a very significant part both in the campaign, the push for independence, and also post-independence. Now, he was born into quite a rich family. Indeed, he was educated in Harrow here in London and went to Trinity College, Cambridge and became a lawyer at Inner Temple, much like Gandhi did as well. But he returned in 1912 to India a bit of a radical. Indeed, he formed a bit of a group which Gandhi nicknamed the Young Hooligans, desperately keen for full independence, full of energy, full of excitement and full of socialism. He joins the INC, the National Congress Party, and indeed by 1929 he is the leader of the Congress Party. And under his leadership, the push for Purna Swaraj, total independence from Britain, was being pushed through. Prior to that, they wanted either a home rule or a coalition kind of with the British government, but no, with Nehru in charge, it was all independence or nothing. This is, of course, ultimately achieved in 1947 and Nehru becomes the first Prime Minister of an independent sovereign India and he stays in that role right up to 1964. I'm in Gordon Square in Bloomsbury in London and I'm standing next to a bust of Rabindranath Tagore who it says there was an Indian poet, philosopher and significantly the first Nobel laureate from Asia. He was the first Nobel laureate of any category be it chemistry, peace, physics, whatever. It was literature and it was him who was the first. He was a huge cultural icon in the early part of the 20th century writing wonderful poems about sort of nationalism, religion, relationships and sort of mysticism as well. But, but the reason why I wanted to come here and see him and I think quite a seismic thing he happened in his life is he was knighted by the British King in 1915. He then renounced that knighthood. He gave it back in 1919 following the Amritsar massacre at Jalianabad, where British troops led by Brigadier General Dyer, he ordered that his troops open fire on um, hundreds of unarmed people in Amritsar. He was, Tagore was shocked by this and it shook him to the core because he had a faith in Britain. He wanted to work with Britain. He had ties to Britain and he thought, no, this is too much now. And he became that symbol again for the nationalist movement. He wasn't directly involved as a politician like Nehru and Gandhi, but him being this Nobel laureate, him being this cultural figure did play a huge part. Tagore is not the only South Asian person commemorated here in Gordon Square. Right hidden in the corner is a bust of Noor Inyat Khan, who, as it says there, lived from 1914 to 1944. This is a very interesting tale of an extraordinarily brave and courageous young woman. Her father was an Indian mystic and musician, and her mother was American. And uh, when they were very young, they moved to Paris, and she grew up in Paris and between the wars, between First World War and Second World War, and she was destined for a career as a children's author. But sadly, World War II broke out, they had to move to London. Now, she was fluent in French, so she was recruited as somebody who could help in France, uh, specifically in the SOE, the Special Operation Executive, who we were talked about when we went to visit Violette Salzburg. So she was dropped into occupied France in June of 1943 as a radio operator under the code name Madeleine. Now radio operators are extraordinarily dangerous because you had to put your voice out there, the Gestapo could easily track you, plus you were making noise if you were hidden in some sort of room somewhere. Uh, and she had to do most of this on her own, constantly moving from house to house. Sadly, by the October of 1943, a few months in, she was betrayed by one of her French collaborators and she was arrested. She was taken to Dachau uh, ex uh, concentration camp in Germany and sadly in September of 1944 she was executed along with other members of the SRE, female members of the SRE. And it is recorded in the ledger at Dachau that her final word was liberté because she was tortured and she was interrogated. She never gave up anything. So an extraordinarily brave young woman and it is excellent that she's commemorated here and again it's a story that we perhaps don't always know about. And as far as I could tell, she was the only woman, a South Asian woman, who has a statue of London that I could find. Please let me know if I'm wrong. I hope I am. But here she is in Gordon Square. Well, I think this is a good place to end my odyssey into South Asian history here in Britain. It's been brilliant. It's been really good to see the impact the South Asian community has had in, in the UK. Huge, seismic, transformational, really. And also, it's been really good to find that individuals who perhaps I didn't know too much about before who are memorialised here in Britain. Um, as always, please let me know what you think and I hope you enjoyed that. Please don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you on the next one.